Hi, everyone. Well, we've got a lot to cover today, so let's get started. Welcome to this technical session 3B of ADB's uh, Asia Water Forum. I'm Jeff Wilson, Senior Water Resource Specialist at the Asian Development Bank in Manila, and I will be moderating today's session on behalf of Jiang Feng Zhang, who is not feeling well today. The title of this session is Water Energy Food Nexus. And the key question for the session is, how might we design and deliver projects using a nexus and systematic approach? Now we've all heard about the water energy food nexus, but what does it really mean in practice? Almost all water projects have some interaction or connectivity to energy and food. There can be positive and negative feedbacks between each of these three components, and some of which are not um, immediately obvious. And there are also social and environmental, political and economic implications, and many different stakeholders, each with their own vested interests. So, it's a complicated and multi-dimensional task. In fact, the water energy food nexus can be called a wicked problem, where we may face open questions such as how much water is available? Where is the water coming from? How is it changing in time? What is causing these changes? And that's just for water. We have also similar questions for energy and for food. And this renders the decision-making very difficult. So decision-making requires uh, methodical and probably iterative approaches and adopting interdisciplinary collaboration, which captures a broader knowledge of science, economics, statistics, technology, psychology, politics, et cetera, et cetera. So, to go back to our question, is there a nexus framework which these water projects can be developed under? This is not a trivial question, and I'm looking forward to listening to the presentations today. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our young water professional rapporteur covering this session, Taiba Suhail, a PhD research scholar at the United States Pakistan Center for Advanced Studies in Water, Miran University of Engineering and Technology in Pakistan. Thanks for your help. So we've got 90 minutes. We have five speakers and I will invite each speaker and um, each will have 10 minutes to make their presentation. Um, and that should give us about 30 minutes for Q&A. So if I can remind attendees to post your questions in the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen, and you can vote on the relevance of each question by clicking the thumbs up button. So first up, I'd like to call on Dr. Superana Kachaini, Assistant Professor in the School of Livelihoods and Development at Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Hyderabad, who will give us a presentation entitled Water Food Nexus Through the Lens of Virtual Water Flows, the Case of India. Dr. Katiini is engaged in teaching interdisciplinary courses on climate change, conservation, and development. She has over 10 years of research experience. Prior to being associated with TISS Hyderabad, she was engaged in research on environmental and developmental issues in India with the Energy and Resources Institute, Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Guwahati and IIT Delhi and International River Foundation, where in 2016-17, she received the inaugural Veritas Fellowship from International River Foundation for advancing women's participation in river and water management. Over to you, Superana. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. And I really thank ADB for this uh, opportunity to present my work. I take you to the context of India, and uh, you've already heard about the title. So may I request uh, a shift to the next title uh, slide, please? Thank you. So basically, in this research, I look at the need for transition from water scarcity to security in India. And based on the background information from existing literature and knowledge that is with us, what I have understood is that fresh water scarcity is now being recognized as a global systemic risk. It is not only a concern in India, but in many parts of the world. Secondly, even the Sustainable Development Goal has a specific emphasis on freshwater scarcity, particularly in the target 6.4. So there is a need for thinking about transition from water scarcity to security. And I take a concept called as virtual water flows, which emerges from the water food nexus or looking at water and food uh, as a connection. So next slide, please. Virtual water flow is actually a measure of how much water is embodied in any good or service. And I take the aim of exploring how this concept can play a role in governing the transition towards water security in water scarce economies. And I focus on just one case, and that is India. So there were two main foci of this uh, analysis. First is to identify the states which are falling in water scarce zones in India. Secondly, it is also important to look at which are the states with highest virtual water outflows. That means if they are exporting certain food products, are they also exporting the water embedded in it? And how much is that water that they're losing for other regions and making themselves more scarce? The second aspect or the foci of this analysis was also to uh, explore the priorities for water governance. So water is a state subject in India. And in this case, I look at the priorities in the state water policies. Next slide, please. Uh, I followed uh, two methodological steps. First is a quantitative one that uh, involves assessment of the interstate virtual water flows and uh, looking at the secondary data that is with us from the government departments and also from the research institutes. So the three aspects of the data that were collected were the interstate movement of the goods, mainly looking at the food grains and oil seeds, the water footprints, uh, these are the water accounting uh, measures and are based on each crop. The third data set is the yield of a crop. And based on these three data sets, the analysis was conducted for the period of 1996 to 2014, because this was an important time period for India's agriculture sector. There is a need to extend it further to the present context as well. Uh, the third uh, method, uh, the sorry, the second aspect where I uh, looked at the content analysis of the water policies and the national action plans on climate change. So this is the qualitative uh, step that was undertaken to know of the priorities for water governance. Next slide, please. These are the key findings. As you look at the map on the left. It has two important uh, findings. First is the water scarcity spread in India. The darker parts on the map, the darker blue parts in the uh, towards the right side of the map shows low to moderate water scarcity. If you move towards the center part of India, you can see a lighter blue shade. These are the regions where there is moderate water scarcity. And towards the left part of the map, you can see that these are the crisscross and the vertical lines. Both of these indicate the moderate to high and high water scarcity. The second finding is the states with the highest virtual water flows. There are three main states which are highlighted in the red box. So the first is Punjab uh, in the northwestern part of India. 
that is in a highly water scarce zone. Second state is Andhra Pradesh, which is in the southern part of India, that is also in the high water scarcity zone. The third state is in the eastern part of India, which is West Bengal. It is in the moderate to highly water scarce zone. So already you can see how the water scarcity and highest virtual water outflows states are together. That is raising the concern of producing more food for other regions in highly water scarce context. So this raises the concern about water security. Next slide, please. Uh, all right, so we look at uh, here the case of Punjab. As you can see, Punjab in both the time zones from 1996 to 2005 and 2005 to 2014 is showing you a picture of high virtual water outflows. And these outflows are to other water scarce states. So you can see the three maps and can understand this trend. What is a concern here is that from the first time period to the second, the virtual water exports have increased. So the water scarcity is increasing at a rapid rate in this particular state. Next slide, please. This also leads us to identify the three key priorities for the state of Punjab. The first is the a uh, cropping pattern there. It is highly intensive rice wheat cropping system because both of these are the staple crops in India. And this is encouraged through subsidies on water and electricity usage, even the fertilizer usage. So some of the policy uh, directions have led to increased water scarcity. That is the conclusion here. Second is the overexploitation of groundwater resources to make this production possible. So the map that is shown on the right shows a lot of red region, showing that most of the Punjab area is actually overexploited in groundwater resources. So this is a concern. Where is the water coming from? The third concern is that the water pollution that is rising due to high cropping intensity, the land is not left for, uh, for the fallow period or for the recovery of the soil nutrition for any part of the year. There is uh, the cropping intensity is 189%. That is a concern. And it is leading to the residual toxicity of soil and water in Punjab. Next slide, please. The other two states that uh, we are talking about here are Andhra Pradesh and West Bengal. On the left, you can see Andhra Pradesh. On the right, you can see West Bengal. The trends are also similar to what Punjab's context is, that these highly or moderate to highly water uh, scarce states are producing the food for other regions which are also water scarce. So there is concentration of water scarcity. There is no distribution of water scarcity. That is one main finding here. Secondly, in Andhra Pradesh, the main crops which are leading to this water scarcity are cotton and groundnut, which are of high significance when it comes to farmer income and also food security in the region. Uh, West Bengal is uh, specializing in production of mustard and groundnut. Both are important crops. So the concern here is how do we shift the patterns in production of these important crops? Next slide, please. So again, identifying key priorities from state-specific policies are that both these states have high cropping intensities. Uh, uh, Andhra Pradesh has 126%. West Bengal has 185%. Second is there are these are rain-fed dependent crops. So it also adds to the vulnerability of the farmer's uh, uh, livelihood because Rainfall patterns have been very uncertain due to the changing climate. Uh, for Andhra Pradesh, uh, the concern is also that it is, it is having high exposure to water-mediated disasters, which can lead to changes in the agriculture production. So it is exposed to floods and cyclone. When we look at West Bengal, it also has a similar concern as Punjab. That is the groundwater over-exploitation and some of the additional concerns of high salinity and high concentrations of arsenic and fluoride. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the key conclusions that emerge from this research is that we need to think about sustainable intensification of agriculture, 
production. So intens intensification is happening. But how sustainable is that when we are looking at highly water scarce context? Uh, another important finding is that the states need to learn from each other. So they have similar issues, but they are not interacting as much. And the last is that there needs to be deeper policy engagement, looking at the water food nexus, not just exclusively uh, increasing the food production, but also looking at the water scarcity concerns. Thank you. Last slide where you can find my email. Thank you for any further interaction on this. Yeah. Thanks, doc, Dr. Superrider. That's uh, an interesting presentation. I might have some questions on that later. Um, next up, we have a video from Dr. Daphne Gondaleka, research scientist at the Technical University of Munich, Germany, who will give us a presentation entitled Nexus City, Water Reclamation with Integrated Resource Recovery as a Key Water Energy Food Nexus Potential for Cities to Transition to a Circular Economy. Uh, Dr. Gondaleka is an urban planner and research scientist at the Technical University of Munich, Germany. Um, her research focus is integrated urban planning, water energy food nexus, and multi-stakeholder processes. She heads the urban water energy food nexus lab and coordinates with their water energy food nexus study. Um, she holds a doctorate in urban planning from the University of Tokyo and a master's from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Zurich, and a bachelor from the University of Glasgow, both in architecture and urban design. She has worked as a postdoctoral associate at the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT in the US and the Center for Development Research University of Bonn, Germany. So Daphne has prepared a video for us. Can we please run that video? Good afternoon. My name is Daphne Gonterleker. I'm a research scientist and an urban planner. I'm delighted to be here today and would like to give a talk about the Nexus City, water reclamation with resource recovery for net zero carbon urban development. The challenge we're facing today is that cities consume very high levels of natural resources, such as water, energy, and food, and this is at the root of what is driving climate change, so very generating very high levels of greenhouse gas emissions. So cities need to transition very fast to net zero carbon, and we need to identify key points of inter intervention or action that can be taken to empower cities to do this transition. The water energy food nexus approach gives us an opportunity to identify these key points of action. So taking it as an integrated urban planning framework, the water energy food nexus approach acknowledges that water energy and food are closely interlinked as sectors. So it takes a lot of water to generate energy. It takes a lot of energy to supply and treat water and a lot of water and energy to generate, uh, produce food and to supply food. So there's potential to close resource loops by planning these in conjunction um, that can help us to conserve water and energy. And obviously for a complex approach like that, responsible governance is a very key issue. The Nexus approach can also su support implementation of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. But so far, the Nexus approach has been rarely explicitly implemented in cities worldwide. worldwide. Rajkot in India and Bexu in Sweden are two examples of cities that have managed to do so. So we urgently need um, more Nexus pilot projects that can help us to showcase how the co-benefits of the Nexus, implementing the Nexus approach can work and showcase Nexus operability. So that is what we are trying to do at um, TUM. We have instated a Nexus research and teaching lab at TUM, which is a cross-school initiative, and where we take the key hypothesis that cities are complex systems with low capacities usually, and that integrated urban planning is needed um, to empower cities um, to be able to deal with the complex challenge of climate change holistically. Our research focus is to develop alternative development pathways for cities and visualize these taking a cross-sectoral synergy potential approach. So we look at um, at least three sectors for each case study in conjunction, um, water, energy, and food, but also solid waste, mobility, ecosystem services, and health as being closely related. We also highlight um, synergy potentials between climate change mitigation and adaptation, 
um, approaches and also the interlinkages between natural and social sciences. And we work with case study cities in India, Germany, Ghana, and Niger at the moment predominantly in order to identify key enablers and barriers are also teaching um, the first explicit Nexus lecture at TUM since 2020 with about 130 students enrolled. And TUM is one of the first universities worldwide that has a master level of specialization in the Nexus topic. If you would like to know more, please visit our website, which is here at the bottom of the slide. So within our research, we focus on water recla reclamation with resource recovery as a key opportunity within the Nexus approach. Um, the opportunity is that many cities worldwide have centralized sewer systems in place that however are often old and expensive to maintain. And they are also very water and energy intensive, which makes them uh, not very resilient to climate change impacts, for example, um, decrease in water availability. So these systems um, cannot function with decreased amounts of water and energy, in which case they may malfunction, which is a public health risk. <clears throat> so at the moment, um, only 12% of water, treated water, um, is reused directly worldwide. So this is a huge untapped potential to recover not only water, but also energy and nutrients that are inherent to wastewater. And the market value for these recoverable resources or products from water reclamation is now emerging very rapidly. And particularly decentralized systems can enhance resource recovery because these resources will be less diluted, energy and nutrients less diluted, because decentralized systems um, can be run with uh, decreased amounts of water. And to be able to operationalize this um, we need a shift uh, in our paradigm. For example, at the moment, we are using drinking water to flush the toilets, which surely is no longer timely um, these days. So this is one of our case study um, cities in India, Leh, which is in the Indian Himalaya. This town has been facing very rapid um, urban and population growth due to tourism industry increase. And the result was that um, a lot of water is being abstracted and a lot of uh, wastewater is being generated, which had to be dealt with. So the town is planning a centralized sewage system, and we've been um, supporting the local government with the development of an alternative urban development pathway for the last 10 years now. Ladakh is a semi-arid, high-altitude region. Water is scarce in Ladakh and has always been precious. Water has been managed very carefully for centuries in agricultural settlements. The town lay is the cultural capital of Ladakh. Since opening to tourism in the 1980s, Leh has expanded very rapidly. Adequate fresh water supply and wastewater management are a huge challenge. The uh, population of Leh has been expanding almost expo exponentially, you know, because of tourism and migration. So the demand for water has definitely increased, you know, and uh, there are no easy options, uh, I would say. An alternative solution, as suggested by research, to address water, energy and food issues comprehensively is decentralized wastewater recycling and reuse in the agricultural area of Leh. Wastewater collection in small clusters of hotels, guest houses and households would reduce piping and require less water for flushing. Recycled water could be used to recharge the aquifer locally. Energy would be conserved as less water has to be extracted or lifted to barren fields from the planned central STP. Smaller treatment plants could run on solar energy. Recycled water could be used to regenerate barren fields and grow cash crops with continued use of organic fertilizer improving food security. The decentralized option is more flexible and thus resilient under climate change related water uncertainty. This example of the town Lee shows that in order to conserve natural resources, water, energy and food need to be planned together. Under climate change, implementing business as usual solutions such as centralized sewage systems is a risk. I think we have to develop definitely. We can't continue in the old ways. But it has to be something, you know, which is sustainable, uh, which is suited to the local environment, culture, and, and and I'm sure, you know, if we think seriously about an alternative, there are alternatives.
So what we do in our group is that we try and generate evidence in terms of numbers um, for this um, approach. So we made a decentralized cluster in Lee um, and calculated how much area of urban agriculture could be irrigated if um, we collected about 100 cubic meters of wastewater per day from hotels and guest houses. So it would be one or two hectares of cabbage. We could capture methane to cook for 30 or 40 people per day and organic fertilizer in the height of 12 tons per year could be recovered. So um, this shows that the Nexus approach can support water, energy, and food security in a town like Lee in an integrated and holistic manner and an effective manner too, which can be a model for other cities in India and also cities beyond. So in the case of Munich, um, this approach is also very relevant. Munich has a very dense urban fabric. It's already struggling with heat island effect under climate change um, impacts and the, the centralized sewage system, as I mentioned before, is very old. Um, and in need of expensive repairs. So this is an opportunity to reconceptualize um, systems, our urban infrastructure systems. The rainwater that is falling on Max Forschert could basically meet the water demand for toilet flushing. Um, and also biogas production in the blocks could be as much as 20, could meet as much as 20% of local household electricity demand of the biogas is converted to electricity. So there are a lot of potentials um, also in cities like Munich to operationalize the Nexus approach. And we also showed that implementing a decentralized alternative infrastructure um, in Munich could be the capital cost of such a system could be recuperated within two years. And we just published a paper um, about this in the journal resources, which is gonna appear on the title page and which came out last week. So do look out for that. So to conclude, um, cities worldwide need to reevaluate the sustainability of maintaining cost intensive conventional um, infrastructure systems, particularly old centralized sewer systems. Um, and this could be a huge opportunity to create new models for cities. And the cost of hybrid or decentralized wastewater management may be lower than maintaining these water and energy intensive systems, but um, alternative technology options are not yet readily available but they, because they've been readily tested at urban scales. Implementing such alternatives could have many climate action benefits, for example, lowering greenhouse gas emissions by conservation of water and energy in particular, and can also enable methane capture, which is a very powerful um, climate action potential. Um, revenue streams from water reclamation and resource recovery um, are also coming up. So um, these uh, resources are rapidly gaining in value um, in these times particularly under climate change, but also with current geopolitical um, stresses. And uh, implementing an excess approach will take a novel governance approach. There are many opportunities, business opportunities coming up, but these will um, need also new structures in institutions and can leverage particularly also in public-private partnerships to create green jobs, new green jobs. And to reiterate again, demonstration of the Nexus approach at urban scales um, is really important. That's why we're pushing for that at Nexus at TUM um, in order to generate evidence for the operability of the Nexus approach and its co-benefits that are relevant to cities worldwide. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stephanie, for that video. Next up, we also have a video recording from Dr. Federico de Villa and Dr. Jeremy Kolitz since uh, they cannot present live. It's entitled Food Production and Water Management in Atolls and Low-Lying Pacific Islands. Uh, Dr. De Villa and Dr. Kolitz are with the Institute of Sustainable Futures, University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. Can you please queue up the presentation, please? Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for joining our presentation on food production and water management in atolls and low-lying Pacific Island states. My name is Dr. Federico de Villa. I'm a research director in food systems at the Institute for Sustainable Futures, University of Technology, Sydney. And with me is my co-presenter, Dr. Jeremy Kolitz, uh, who's a research principal at the Institute for Sustainable Futures, UTS. So in today's presentation, we're going to cover the food water nexus and how it applies to island states at a very broad level and the links of food, water and climate and what that means for governing water and food resources in atoll islands. 
For a little bit of context, uh, globally, as we know, water and food security risks are very likely to increase given the population pressures and climate shocks affecting different regions of the world. And the Pacific Island regions uh, in all its diversity and different countries with different geographies is no exception to these strains of population growth and climate shocks. A lot of these islands are highly exposed to different types of climate risks and geographic isolation and remoteness plays a role in how communities and national governments manage the impacts of climate on food and water. Now, the concept of the nexus and nexus thinking has been very prevalent in the literature and in development since the early 2000s, but a lot of this work has been very Southeast Asian focused, and there has been very little nexus thinking applied to the Pacific Islands regions. There has been substantial work done in both water and in agriculture by different funders and different researchers, but the integration of these concepts hasn't really been done in much depth in the Pacific region. Uh, in terms of funding, water, uh, so wash and water resources and agriculture continue to attract a lot of investments from bilateral and multilateral donors, but agriculture, uh, according to the Pacific Aid Map, receives 10 times more investment than water in the Pacific, indicating the potential opportunities to align water and food investments to support both sectors. So for the study, we took a water food nexus framework approach, which we developed drawing from high level panel of experts in food systems, as well as some water food nexus uh, research. And we largely conceptualize water resources as three types that exist in the Pacific region, so groundwater, rainwater, and surface water, and how they interact with domestic and industry users in the black box, and the different types of agricultural uses in the Pacific islands, largely home gardens, agroforestry systems, and cash crop production. And throughout our literature review, we identified four types of nexus links that are relevant for how water and food are managed in the region. The first one is competition between the resources and the activities that use water. The second one are the impacts of climate change on agriculture and how they're mediated by water. So for example, issues related to uh, drought. The third nexus link is how agriculture systems and farm activities impact water systems, particularly in terms of uh, overuse of water or pollution. And the fourth one is water quality for agricultural use, particularly uh, things like salinity and how that impacts the viability of some uh, agricultural crops. So to go into a bit more detail, I will hand over to my colleague, Jeremy, if you please unmute yourself to talk about water and climate. Thanks. Thank you, Fed. And in particular, I'm going to talk about water and atolls in the climate context. Water resources and atolls in some low-lying countries is very unique and fragile. So all natural fresh water on atolls exists as a shallow groundwater lens and whatever rainwater falls on um, at any given time. So there's typically no significant surface water sources on atolls. So the freshwater lens uh, is underneath the atoll and it floats on top of seawater that's underneath it. And the groundwater, the freshwater lens underground is typically thicker in the middle of the island and thinner at the uh, coastal areas or uh, along the, the, the lagoon and the ocean. But it's shallower and easier to reach along the coast and that's significant for reasons I'll explain on the next slide. And the freshwater in atolls is often susceptible to contamination due to the porous uh, soil, um, which allows contaminants from surface and human activities to reach the freshwater lens relatively easily. In the context of climate change, there's several threats from climate hazards for these water resources. Sea level rise is one of the most significant ones. Um, increasing sea levels causes um, saline intrusion through the ground into that shallow freshwater lens, but it also raises the likelihood of overtopping in which storm surges push water over the surface of the island, and then it enters the groundwater through open wells. It pushes the freshwater lens higher towards the surface, which makes it easier to get to, but it also means it's more um, easily contaminated 
from contaminants at the surface. Uh, sea level rise creates erosion along the coasts, which can damage water supply infrastructure. And sea level rise also displaces people from their homes. And those displaced people then need uh, water supplies to, to meet their needs. Changes in rainfall are difficult to predict um, for Pacific Island countries. Some um, projections suggest that the Western Pacific will see drying trends while the Eastern side will see um, wetter conditions. Uh, more extreme rainfall raises the likelihood of contamination as extreme rainfall events create surface runoff, which can carry contaminants into water sources and um, drying conditions can create difficulties in terms of storing water um, in rainwater and also can lower the groundwater table. But droughts are difficult to predict in the Pacific Island region. And then finally, even in areas where water, or excuse me, annual rainfall increases, that might not translate to an increase in groundwater tables because of higher temperatures, which increase evapotranspiration. And finally, the IPCC suggests that cyclones are being pushed northward um, away from Pacific Island countries and territories, which may mean there's fewer cyclones impacting Pacific Islands, but they'll have greater intensity and the wind damage from those uh, greater, stronger cyclones can create damage to water resources or water supplies. So on atolls, the uh, ways of using water um, are limited because of the limited number of water resources and the pressures um, on them. People make use of uh, hand pumps and wells, um, which may be privately owned, and these are often used for domestic purposes. And sometimes they're used for drinking or for livestock, but they're not recommended for drinking because they're easily contaminated from the surface runoff that comes through um, poor soils and sanitation pollution. And they can cause uh, upconing whereby they draw in salt water if they're overused. Rainwater harvesting is commonly used in atolls for drinking um, and sometimes for domestic purposes, but it's hard to draw store large volumes that will last throughout an entire dry season and they're often contaminated by animal feces. Piped water exists on bigger atolls, such as the capitals uh, like Funafuti and South Tarawa, and those may come from desalination or from groundwater. So those are used for commercial and productive purposes, um, but they're only available on the biggest atolls and they can also cause drought on of the groundwater table if they're overused. Desalinization is available on some islands with bigger desalination units on some and, and smaller scale ones on others. Uh, these units are very expensive um, to purchase and maintain. Um, they require a supply chain of spare parts and disposing the brine um, is a difficulty from an environmental management point of view. There's also packaged water, such as bottled water, which can be imported, but this is expensive and it creates plastic waste. And then finally, communities on these islands um, have their own traditional methods of obtaining water. For example, in the photo on the right, where they've carved a hole into a tree, which then collects rainwater. But these traditional methods are usually can only generate a small amount of water or sometimes used in emergencies. So I'll head back to Fed now to talk about agri-food systems and atolls. Thanks for that, Jeremy. So what does this mean for food production and agri-food systems in atoll communities? Well, the first is that food systems are made up of the interaction of what is grown and what people have access to in terms of healthy food, but also shifting environmental and food consumption patterns. In the Pacific region, particularly in atolls, uh, food is largely imported from uh, overseas, particularly Western countries. And this has led to a shift in diets towards particularly more unhealthy diets full of uh, sugary and processed foods. And part of the reason for this are the trade agreements combined with the lack of genetic and crop diversity opportunities that exist on atolls to grow nutritious and healthy food. The soil conditions and the limited water context coupled with the current and future climate scenarios indicate that growing healthy food is going to continue to be a challenge in atolls. With that said, there's a lot of interest for revitalizing traditional varieties that might be more suitable to grow in the changing soil and water context of atolls. And as Jeremy explained, the environmental context of food systems indicates that a combination of potentially severe um, climate events, potential drought and changing water conditions will influence how food is grown in the region. 
So what does this mean for atolls and the change of water climate food conditions? One of the important aspects uh, of atolls water food governance is that the modern day governance of Pacific Islands is com a combination of traditional notions of the state and the traditional systems we, we briefly mentioned in the water and food context. And it's the combination of these formal governance and informal community governance approaches that are really important for managing land and water in Pacific atolls. They do have very different governance systems throughout the region. So for example, Kiribati has things they call the drought management plans, which vary between islands. I'm really working at this island level within the current and their context specific management systems is really important. These context specific management approaches to the island may not, may not align with what the national governments say. So it's important to understand the interaction between national and island communities. Villages and communities have a very strong ownership and understanding of the traditional knowledges and how this intersects with science and new technologies is an important area of potential research and collaboration to see how we can blend traditional knowledge and um, modern technologies. And in terms of regional partners and funders that can support this integration of traditional management with Western science, uh, there's agencies such as SPC that are increasingly working towards blending different types of knowledge towards managing water resources and food. So overall, in this brief presentation, we've provided you a very high level overview of the types of issues that are relevant in atolls in the context of water and food. Please feel free to get in touch if you have any further questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that, uh, that video presentation. Uh, next up, I'd like to call on Mr. Dong Nok Tu, Business Development Manager, Smart Universal Logistics, who will give us a presentation entitled Water by Wind Project to Tackle Salinity Intrusion Problem at the Lower Mekong Delta Basin in Southern Vietnam. Mr. Tu works for Smart Universal Logistics in projects in Vietnam tackling climate, tackling climate change related problems that directly affect poor farmers in the Mekong Delta region. Over to you, Mr. Tu, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, okay. uh, thank you, Jeff, uh, for introducing me. Um, so uh, my name is Tu, uh, I'm working for Smart Universal Logistics. And we've been working in Vietnam for uh, more than uh, 20 years, uh, mainly in, in the north relating to industrial uh, application, uh, industrial zones and port uh, developments. But now we're moving further to the south and we are trying to help the Vietnamese government to uh, solve some of their problems relating to uh, water uh, consumptions. So I see in uh, most of the presentation today, uh, people are speaking a lot about the relationship between water demand and, and uh, food security. And I, I, I see that Vietnam is one of the prime example of, uh, of this problem. Um, wait. So um, in Vietnam, especially in the Mekong Delta, uh, rice is uh, the main product uh, of the country. So uh, Vietnam is one of the biggest exporter of rice and also one of the biggest uh, consumer of rice. And the Mekong Delta region of Vietnam is producing 50% of the amount of rice of the country. Um, but uh, due to climate change and also the effects from uh, neighboring countries, uh, particularly um, the, uh, Laos and uh, Thailand and Cambodia, uh, they're building upstream dams uh, for irrigation themselves as well. So... Um, so the water coming from the Mekong uh, are not going to the downstream at the uh, at the Mekong Delta Basin of, the, of Vietnam. Uh, that that is why the farmers do not have enough fresh water for irrigating their rice, and uh, at the same time uh, there's a sea level rising. That's why the the salinity is increasing up to hundred kilometers inland of uh, of the countries. And um, salt water is not very good for um, for rice fuel and also for irrigating other kind of crops in the country. In particular, uh, every year um, there are more than 200,000 hectares of, uh, of rice uh, damaged by um, by sal salinity in the river water of the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, and also 100,000 of uh, households are being affected. So um, we've been requested directly by the Vietnamese farmer, uh, by the Vietnamese government, 
to uh, trying to find a kind of new solution to help them uh, solve this problem, especially when the farmers they're having to um, to use uh, water tran transported by uh, by trucks from more than 100 kilometers inland uh, to coastal provinces, and they're paying really really high price for both uh, domestic water and irrigation water. So. Um, yeah, uh, some of them even are converting rice farms into shrimp ponds and and fish ponds, and that is really um, bad for 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 both the, the the soil environment and also for the water environment because they are, you know, for these kind of business, they're having to use antibiotics and other kind of chemicals in the productions, so it further pollute uh, both the groundwater, surface water, and also the soil. So once the farms that have been converted to shrimp ponds, they can never be uh, reconvert into um, rice fields. So this is kind of like a deteriorating um, situation in Vietnam. So uh, I have a little videos today to show what we are trying to do in Vietnam. Uh, I'm just going to show a little bit of it um, uh, because we don't have really a lot of time. <laughs> Okay, uh, maybe, yeah. So uh, from from the videos, you can see the, um, the kind of technology that we're trying to introduce here is what we call a water by wind system. So basically we're trying to combine the technology of reverse osmosis with the applications of uh, renewable energy and batteries into uh, producing water for the farmers. Um, uh, maybe, Everyone has known that um, the, the the process of um, producing uh, fresh water from uh, sal saline water is very is very energy intensive. That's why we're introducing uh, renewable energy into the uh, the combinations, and at the same time, renewable energy could serve as a, a second line of uh, of a revenue stream to the system, so we can reduce uh, significantly the cost for producing per cubic meters of water. Um, so um, the, one of the advantage of this kind of system is that we, for one system, we can serve multiple locations, especially when they are in remote area, uh, because in each of these uh, system, we're introducing batteries as a kind of backup energy. So then uh, when the reverse osmosis, they are they are moving to another location, they can continuously uh, produce water and maximize uh, the productions for, um, for, uh, of water for the farmers. Um, we have built already the first demonstration plant in the province of Ninh Thuan, uh, also in the south of Vietnam, but it's not in the Mekong Delta. Um, and we are operating this system already for four months. Um, uh, but this system is at the smaller capacities uh, of uh, 20 cubic meters per day. But uh, when we are uh, going to the full scale, we need to be going to uh, have uh, 800 to 1,000 cubic meters per day system, depending on the location. Uh, the first demonstration in Ning Tuan, we are supplying uh, drinking water for free to uh, tens of poor households in Ning Tuan. And also we are testing uh, irrigating using this water for 2,000 uh, square meter of fruits. Um, the barge we are using now is self-propelled. So we have also driver uh, skippers on, on these barge to move from uh, 
from the original locations of the, of the system to the other locations where we're going to pump the water on the shore for, for the fruits. Um, so the, from the demonstration of our, of, of our system, we can see that there are several challenges and also opportunities for, for these kind of technologies. Uh, the first um, opportunity is that this, the water can be produced for both domestic consumptions and for irrigation consumptions. And uh, it really depends on which location um, require uh, what kind of water that we can uh, customize the units uh, for that particular locations. Um, the supply for irrigation water, uh, there's um, there's uh, challenges in, in, in terms of storage because uh, we see that uh, irrigation water, they don't, do not require daily supply of water, but really depending on the season and what kind of crops that they require. And uh, we see that in, in some months, they require a significant higher um, amount of water than the capacity of the of, uh, of system is, uh, is allowed. That is why we see that uh, we need to introduce more uh, good storage uh, solutions for, for irrigation water if we want to, to implement this um, kind of technology in, um, in agriculture. And um, the second challenge will be renewable energy. Now we are introducing wind energy as a main uh, source of renewable energy for the system, but it really depends uh, on uh, what kind of remote location that we are, uh, we're in. The reason why we're introducing uh, wind energy is because the south of Vietnam has a really good uh, potential in renew uh, in a uh, wind energy. But for example, if we want to apply this kind of technology in locations um, in, uh, for example, India or in uh, or in uh, Africa, where there are also a, a lot of remote locations that is requiring uh, fresh water, and these locations they have a much higher potential in solar energy or in in tidal energy. For example, if you're going to apply this kind of technology in in atoll or in a remote island, we actually had some conversation with the university in Greece for a uh, possibility of applying this unit in uh, several uh, islands in Greece. And there's, uh, according to the assessments, there's really high potential of uh, using this, uh, this unit in uh, you know, using solar energy in islands in Greece. But if, of course, this is, um, depends on the further analysis uh, and also cooperation between our company and universities. So um, uh, yeah, that's it for uh, my presentation today. And uh, I hope, um, you know, from my presentations, we can really have um, better conversations with uh, research partners that uh, we are seeing today and also maybe uh, from the connections that see how we can implement this kind of um, solutions for other locations outside Vietnam. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Tu, for that interesting presentation. And the, the last speaker I would like to call on is Ms. Gita Shrista, National Researcher for the International Water Management Institute, uh, commonly called IMI, who will give us a presentation entitled Technology for Whom? Solar Irrigation Pumps, Women and Smallholders in Eastern Terai, Nepal. Gita has worked extensively as a researcher and gender specialist in the past 15 years in Nepal, and India. Her research interest revolves around intersectionality, human environmental relations, gender, and social justice. She has developed gender training manuals, served as a trainer on gender and social inclusion for community mobilizers and local stakeholders, and mainstreamed gender and community implementation models, research projects, and organizations. She has also served as a lecturer at various reputed universities in Nepal and team leader for project evaluation teams at the Social Welfare Council in Nepal and contributed as an author and reviewer to international journals and books on gender and social inclusion across Nepal. Over to you, Gita. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ita Shrishta, and I work as a national researcher at the International Water Management Institute in Nepal. Um, previous speakers, they have highlighted uh, water and uh, food-related problems, and also uh, Dom just highlighted uh, the solution to address uh, these kinds of problems in the forms of technology. There is a huge emphasis in the technology to solve WIFI, water, food, energy problems these days. My presentation in my presentation, I basically talk about talk about uh, when we talk about these kind of solution technology. Um, how do we ensure gender and social justice issues? How do we ensure that these kind of technology do benefit the most marginalized sections of the population? So in our research, we talk about solar irrigation pump technology, and our research is based in Eastern Tarai in Nepal. In this research, we have investigated um, three solar irrigation pump technology implemented by three organizations. Number one, Alternative Energy Promotion Center. This is a nodal organization in Nepal which promotes renewable energy. Um, second, by EC Mode, and third, by EMI, in collaboration with an INGO called IDE. All these three screens are uh, different in their objectives as well as technical uh, specifications. For example, in case of AAPC, it aims to raise awareness about solar irrigation pumps. EC Mode uh, wanted to test three financial models and adoption of SEP by women with additional 10% extra subsidy. And EMI IDE was a collective model which was implemented at a very small scale with four farmers group and it was um, the the objective was to improve the livelihood of women marginal and tenant farmers. Similarly, in terms of financial model, AAPC Alternative Energy Promotion Center, they relied on renewable energy subsidy policy 2016, which stipulates 60% of subsidy uh, in the total cost of solar irrigation pumps. EC Mode has three financial models, subsidy, loan, and rental. And EMI ID distributed a very small scale uh, sunflower solar irrigation pumps to four uh, collectives. This is a qualitative research. We conducted our field uh, work into two phases. In the first phase of field work, uh, we interviewed uh, SIP recipients. We conducted 40 semi-structured interview. And in the second uh, phase of the field work, we interviewed those who were left out in the first phase of the field work, who are not SIP recipients, but who use water from solar irrigation farms. And we interviewed poor women Dalit share cropping farmers. <clears throat> For the analysis, we draw on three-dimensional theory of change by the 2018. We focus on intersectionality and questions, who has received SIP? If women have received uh, solar irrigation pump, who are these women? Then we delve into the outcome questions of uh, solar irrigation pumps. In terms of practical outcome, we assess, assess the impact of SIP on water access, productivity, and income. We also uh, explore if the technology is woman-friendly woman and what is its impact on land and livelihood opportunities. In terms of strategic impact, we assess changes in gender stereotypes and rules and gender relations. So to answer the first question, who has a, uh, received a solar irrigation pump in both AAPC and EC mode schemes, we found that it's majority men, well-connected men, well-networked, highly educated, and they have their own minimum two bigger, that is 72,900 square feet land. In case of EMI IDE scheme, since it was directly targeted at landless, near landless, and women and Dalit farmers, they have benefited from the scheme. There were women who have received solar irrigation pump. For example, in case of AAPC, it's 22%, and in case of EC mode, it's 24.4%. But who are these women? Majority of these women from these households, they do not farm themselves. They are elderly. They have received information from men and processed all the documentation uh, regarding SIP through men. These women are majority from absentee landlord households. They practice sharecropping and they have members migrants to develop nations. In terms of practical outcomes, 
Uh, the study finds that SIP is useful. It has enabled easy and reliable access to irrigation water, which has led to increase in crop productivity and uh, increased income of the households. We also find that uh, this uh, solar irrigation pump is woman friendly. It is not uh, physically demanding. Uh, it does not require bringing the solar irrigation, uh, sorry, uh, irrigation pumps back and forth from the field. To some extent, it has reduced dependency of women on men, and it has also helped to uh, save labor and time. Since now there is access to water, it has also broadened the scope of sharecropping practices by land, uh, by Dalit and uh, landless farmers, marginalized farmers. And uh, the schemes has embedded uh, technical uh, trainings on uh, vegetable farming and aquaculture. So the farmers have also received uh, trainings on uh, these skills. Uh, but uh, Positive practical impacts may not necessarily lead to uh, strategic outcomes. Women's positions in the household, in the community, there are different kinds of social inter social identities which are overlapping and intersecting, such as age, gender, age, class, caste, ethnicity, religion, household structure, and migrations, uh, migration status of the household. It influenced women's agency to benefit from solar irrigation pump technology. We find that there are changes in gender roles. Gender roles are changing. Women are irrigating the fields themselves, but it, has, it hasn't changed uh, gender stereotypes that irrigation is a man's job. In high caste and class uh, households, in these households, the women irrigate the field only when the, when the men are absent, they are not in the house. In case of MEID, it's where, where there is a collective ownership of SEP. Uh, women do irrigate field themselves, but the issue of uh, maintenance and operation of uh, pump again lies with the uh, men. We investigated changes in gender relations uh, in terms of women's uh, agency um, with regard to deciding uh, with SIP related issues, for example, whether to attend uh, solar irrigation pump related training or not, whether to install a solar irrigation pump, uh, where to install solar irrigation pump, uh, how to use it, whether to use it for crop, vegetables, aquaculture, or any other activities. Our resource shows that all these kind of decisions related to solar irrigation pumps are uh, taken by men. Even if uh, women, uh, they keep uh, the earnings from the farming, agriculture, uh, they decide on everyday issues, uh, but the major record keeping and financial transaction is done by men. Except in households, uh, which is nuclear, migrant households, where women are de facto household heads. Impact of solar irrigation pump uh, differs between men and women, but also among women. For example, high caste, high class women, they are spending additional uh, safe time in additional household activities. But this has turned to be an income earning opportunities for women from low caste and class households. So uh, there is a need to understand the differences in needs and experience experiences of not only between men and women, but among women. It is because solar irrigation pump may mean different for different categories of women. Pathways of empowerment for high caste, high class women may be different from those who are from low caste and low uh, class. So these things should be uh, integrated in the objectives and design of the top technology, as well as in all kinds of procedures, including deployment, technology deployment procedures. And it's important that we should add measures that uh, address uh, uh, underlying structures, power structures, norms, uh, unequal relations, in addition to the practical uh, impacts or measures of the interventions. Uh, we put forward certain recommendations, uh, tailor technology to socioeconomic context and needs of marginalized farmers, avoid shallow targeting of farmers, uh, establish local monitoring mechanisms to monitor elite capture and ease documentation process, and include measure of transformative gender and social relations. Uh, thank you. 
Thanks, Gita, for that interesting presentation. Um, I'd like to uh, thank all presenters at this time. We are keeping um, to our timetable, and that's very good. Um, so we're going to enter the, the Q&A phase. Um, when I introduce the session, I uh, pose the question whether we are, um, how we might design and deliver projects using a nexus and systematic approach. Um, listening to the presenters, I, I, I can't really see any common framework between all of the approaches used. Um, maybe some of the details have been you know, hidden behind. Um, but I want to open up one question to all the presenters to, to think about. Um, can you just comment on, on whether the application or one of the applications you presented today ended up with a triple win. That is a, a win in the water, a win in the energy, and a win in the food. And whether um, you know, such a triple win, win is, pos is, is possible or, or whether you will need to get a loss in any one or two of those um, components of the water food energy nexus. So um, if we can start in the order of the, of the presentations, and to comment on whether such a triple win is possible. Thank you. Katarina, uh, thank you. Start? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I think it is possible, but from the case uh, that I presented, uh, I don't think yet the win was achieved. So if it is a win for agriculture, it is a loss for water in the present context. Uh, to make that win for water and energy as well, we need to bring about the visibility of water resources. It's yet hidden. So that is why it's a loss for water because it's the nature of water is hidden and it's a flow. Thank you. Thank you. Daphne, I'm not sure whether you can uh, respond from where you are, but if you are there. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, um, so our cases are hypothetical. We haven't actually built these, so we don't know how it would work. But in theory, there would definitely be a triple win um, in, in all terms. Uh, I don't really see that uh, there would be a detriment to one of the three through the other also. But as I said, um, we, would, we are trying to test this in the real world to find out how it would work. And um, I wonder whether other wins would be more important um, for the local government to be able to take decisions on this, such as job creation, or in the case of Lee, it could be protection of the groundwater quality or so that that would need to be factored in as well. That's a good point. I might pick up on that later. Thank you. Um, Dr. Federico or Dr. Jeremy? Um, um, yep, go ahead. Yes, I, I, I'm here, Jeff, and thank you, everyone, for listening. Look, in terms of our presentation context of our tools, the triple win is actually quite difficult because we didn't look at energy. It was an inevitable limitation of our work. But a potential win-win on the two sectors is the traditional way of working with high salinity tolerant crop varieties and the way agriculture departments support those varieties and how that can potentially be used to deal with the increase in salinity in freshwater. But I would also highlight that part of the Nexus approach is dealing with trade-offs and understanding what wins and what needs to be lost in managing the three different sectors. Thank you, Jeff. It's a good point you make about the trade-offs and maybe that's also a point we can pick up later. Um, Mr. Tu, can you comment on it, please? Uh, yes. Um, so triple win is actually what we are trying to aim for, but um, that that will be uh, when we can successfully introduce the the full scale unit. The first um, well, the first demonstration that we having now in Ningtuan, uh, we do not use yet uh, wind energy, but we use mainly the energy from the grid uh, to test the uh, um, the interaction between all the components of the desalination unit. And we see that the desalination uh, technology is uh, quite energy intensive. Um, that's, that is why during uh, this time of the year, during summer, when people are using a lot of air conditioning um, and using more energy for cooling their, their households, that we have a kind of fluctuation in energy supply for, for the desalination uh, unit. 
So now we can, uh, you know, successfully supplying um, uh, water for for the farmers and also for for the testing irrigation uh, parts. But the energy we cannot secure yet. But in the future, uh, we uh, when we introducing the, the wind energy in it. Uh, I think certainly we can uh, try to make a win out of that. And one of the um, uh, uh, points I would like to point out is that uh, these technologies are not uh, cheap themselves. And uh, that is why we need to have also, um, you know, cooperation with the local government in terms of how uh, to uh, to to educate the farmers to better governing uh, their water consumptions, to uh, to ensure that there's uh, there's reductions in in terms of water loss in the in the system, and also there should be some kind of subsidies um, uh, instruments to be introduced in the, in this system, uh, to be to reduce the overall cost to uh, produce uh, you know uh, of selling water to the farmers. Yeah. Right. Thank you, uh, Gita. Your comments, please. Yes, um, solar irrigation pumps in uh, Nepal case is very new. So we don't have cases uh, as such in India where there is problem with groundwater depletion. But um, at this present moment, small scale solar irrigation pump is a solution to uh, efficient use of water, uh, food uh, production as well as energy. But uh, I would argue that if we don't consider gender equality and uh, social inclusion issues uh, in these kinds of uh, mixes, then it will carry risks of uh, aggravating existing uh, inequalities, social and gender inequalities, and uh, as uh, already indicated by previous sector uh, speaker, it could be a big governance problem as well when there is no inclusion in the overall framework of the Nexus Wi-Fi Nexus uh, scenario. Thank you. Thanks, and perhaps that's a point I'd like to pick up a little bit further. Um, one could easily um, sort of conceptualize that you could quantify water, energy, and food as like a three-dimensional metric and have uh, a number associated with each. But And then that number would quantify the value or the utility of you know, each of the water, energy, and food. But, but I've heard a couple of things over the last um, hour or so which, which would uh, throw this kind of in, into, uh, into confusion. People are talking about flexibility, resilience, sustainability, gender, and inclusivity. I mean, you know, how can you quantify uh, water, energy, and food, as well as these other more subjective um, aspects that I've just mentioned? Um, and perhaps, Gita, can I ask you to go first on this? Um, well, this is a difficult question for me. I don't know how to quantify this. Uh, to me, I think uh, uh, both methods, you know, like to capture the subjective uh, uh, issues to qualitative research as well as quantitative, it has uh, its own relevance. So, yeah, thank you. Right. Um, would anyone else like to comment on this? Uh, I know it's a difficult question, but um, we, we value your inputs. Miss uh, Fed, go ahead, please. Sorry, Fed put his hand up. Thank, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, look, I'll quickly also reflect on this. I think it's a really important question, thinking, for example, Pacific Islands, where just the quantitative data on water systems is so out of date. So that in itself makes it really hard to understand what the biophysical context of water, food, and energy are. But in terms of the need to quantify, I'd also reflect that in, at least in the Pacific region, there's a lot of value for the uh, qualitative and traditional approach to knowledge. So this is oral histories, family histories, island histories, and they actually play a really important role in managing the resource. So at least in the Pacific context, about really finding this balance between the available data and information from the technological and, and technocratic way of thinking and combining that with the traditional way of thinking and managing resources of the islands. Thanks, Jeff. Just shows you it's much more difficult than we thought. Um, Daphne put her hand up, and then after Daphne, we have Mr. Tu. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I just want to comment on the quantification part, and uh, I think we can't quantify resilience or sustainability very well. Um, and also that we're running out of time as humanity to, to act, so we need to put more faith again in our common sense. And because that's what we do in our heads, we compute 
all kinds of complex things all the time and we call it instinct or something. But uh, we should focus more on what kind of processes are in place that make a town like Lee try to implement a centralized sewage system when so many people who are there obviously think that it's not a good solution and it's not very climate resilient um, in order to empower local governments like that to be able to implement other solutions, alternative solutions that would be more climate resilient. I know that numbers always help, but we just can't get numbers for a lot of these things. Even knowing how much groundwater is available in Lay, I think we'll, we'll never know until it's gone. Thank you. Mr. Tu? Uh, yes. Um, so uh, what, what we're trying to do is to improve the food security in Vietnam. So uh, the, the, the elements that we're trying to, end, to quantify first is what is the exact water demand of each of the province of Vietnam? Uh, that is required. That's and then we're going to customize uh, the the solution for such a locations. And energy would be uh, the next element that we consider because energy is more like um, sup supplement um, to to this kind of system, so that the system could be more efficient and do not uh, uh, require a lot of uh, you know not uh, renewable energy. Um, so uh, we, uh, for example, in Nington, we we had a research team to go uh, to go there and uh, and speak with the local governments to uh, to to identify which was the location in in the province that requires the most water, and uh, for which application the water is going to be used for, and then uh, from there we uh, we pick the locations for um, for for the first demonstration to put in. So uh, for the further application of this, we're going to do a, a more extensive survey in um, in other location to select um, where where the people are most affected, and uh, we customize the situation the the, um, the application for for there as well, and uh, so on for for other countries. Um, and actually, our company we we already went to to India and to Africa to uh, try to. To quantify which is which we think that uh, the most important um, element, which is the water demand. Thank you, and uh, Dr. Katia Ini, please. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, yes, uh, very interesting to hear everybody's uh, viewpoints here. I just wanted to add, like, uh, I think an interdisciplinary approach is quite important to consider the aspects of resilience, inclusivity. Because uh, when it comes to uh, any discipline's uh, approach to water, energy, food nexus, it will always fall short. So we must come uh, with an interdisciplinary approach. And second aspect, I think, is the scale. Because at a macro scale, it is difficult to understand resilience and inclusion. But at a micro scale, it is still possible to bring in these concepts in the nexus approach. So these are the two things, because at a uh, micro scale, we can also have a participatory approach to understanding the nexus from the viewpoints of the uh, female farmers as well. So thank you. Great comments, great conclusion. Um, we've got a question from Wesley Pereira. Is the water energy food nexus concept any way different from the integrated water resources management concept? Um, and he, he goes on a little bit further, but I, I, let's just cut it there. Um, how, how do we see it as being anything different from the, the, the uh, integrated water resources management concept, which has been around for, for 30 years or more? Uh, Fed, is that a new hand or an old hand? Yeah, that's, a, that's a new hand, Jeff. Um, ahead, yeah, Jeff. look, I, I, I saw this question and uh, it's really interesting because we wrote about that for the report for this project. And I guess the conclusion we came to is that RWRM is still very valid in the context of water security and water scarcity and meeting these different socioeconomic goals. But we found it often lacks the food security and nutrition dimensions and the energy security dimensions of sustainable development. So in our analysis, we say, look, RWRM is still a guiding principle for water resources management with some social elements and economic elements. But if we want to also improve nutrition outcomes and improve energy and renewable energy security, then we do need to expand towards this nexus framing. So that was sort of the conclusion we came to, but yeah, interesting to hear what other panelists think. Okay, I think I'm going to move to another question. 
Um, to all speakers, in your examples, did you come across any cross-sectoral conflicts or tensions? And are there mechanisms in place to deal with conflicts? Uh, any of the speakers, please. No conflicts? Surely there's conflicts. Yep, go ahead, uh, Dr. Kathyeni. Yes, definitely. There are sectoral conflicts over resources. So in a populated, uh, in populated countries in Asia and Africa, uh, there is always conflict over water. Which sector should it go to? Agriculture, industry, and ah. other sectors. Even there is conflict over energy. And when it comes to highly populous areas in Asia, there is conflict over food as well. So Nexus approach actually has a potential to bring down these conflicts by understanding the linkages. Thank you. And um, just to push that a little bit further, um, how would you deal with it uh, in terms of um, the mechanisms to, to deal with the conflict? Okay, we'll have Mr. Two. Go ahead, Mr. Two, please. Uh, yes. So what, what, what I'm pointing out here is not exactly a conflict, uh, but it's more like an imbalance between uh, the different sectors. For example, um, the price of the Vietnamese government uh, is, is asking for, from the farmers for water is, is really lower than uh, for them to really recover the cost for producing fresh water. Um, and to be able to uh, to uh, to charge this price, that there's the require um, there needs to be subsidies for water productions, so that um, the governments or, or whichever private sector that is introducing the new technology for for producing water can survive themselves. I saw one of the questions in uh, in the chat box um, asking whether the first demonstration unit is uh, economically self sufficient. And uh, I have to say that it's not because uh, the first uh, six months of operations that was funded completely by the Belgian government so that we can supply the water for free for the six months. But for the full scale, there needs to be a kind of instruments to support um, you know, the, the Vietnamese government to be able to, uh, to, to have this system and produce water at the uh, reasonable price for the farmers. But we see that uh, for uh, for example, when the farmers do not have fresh water and they're having to use trucks to buy water themselves from private sellers, they are readily paying a much more exp expensive price than what the government is uh, offering. Uh, the only um, limit limiting from the government is that they cannot offer uh, water at a reasonable price if they're going to produce water uh, on site there because they do not have uh, the ability to uh, to desalinize um, the water from the river at the Mekong. It's a good point. Um, if you're not paying for the for the real price of the water, um, you know you're distorting the the economics. Now maybe that's deliberate, um, and maybe there are there are bigger wins um, that that the government are looking at. But the cost of water, the real cost of water, does need to be factored in at some stage. Um, but just to continue on with this question. Did, did anyone ever have some sort of community dialogue where they presented their results um, to the community and, and got their feedback? Um, because, you know, sometimes these uh, concepts, um, somebody mentioned trade-offs before, you know, there are some negatively impacted industries and people. Um, so you need to be transparent and bring in community consultation. Did anyone do this in any of your projects? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Tu. Uh, yes, uh, so the the 10 families that we worked with, uh, that we are supplying water with at first, they were very skeptical about the quality of the water because they are too used to it using water produced by the government. So when a private uh, company comes in and, and trying to test the projects, they're asking whether the water is good enough for them uh, for domestically use. To be a, so uh, what we had to do is that we have to bring our water to the, to the government's um, lab to try to do a, a full testing according to the, uh, to the government of Vietnam um, requirements of, of drinking water. And we need to show this result to uh, to the people. 
um but that that'd be like um you know extra expense to 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 the project but uh we we need to address that to be to show the farmers that the the water is good yeah. yes and did anyone um present any community consultation where one of the communities were negatively impacted Yeah, go ahead, Dita, please. Uh, not exactly, but we did uh, disseminate our result, uh, research findings at the community level, as well as uh, to directly to Alternative Energy Promotion Center, which is a nodal uh, organization, public organization for promotion of renewable energy. Uh, so based on our uh, research recommendation, they have changed the criteria for uh, eligibility criteria for uh, SIPFA subsidy. For example, um, they have reduced the um, land size, you know, like before this was like, okay, this there should be one hectare of land, but now they have reduced the size so, so that they can uh, uh, prioritize women and uh, marginalized farmers as well, smallholders as well. Thank Thanks. You. And Daphne, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to uh, tell a little bit about our stakeholder process in Lee, which we have been running for 10 years. And at the time we arrived, they had already decided to have this, this, this centralized steward system built. And we've been having consultations every year or twice a year since then, and it keeps going around in circles. It's really difficult, even though everyone understands the benefits of the centralized system. In the end, um, they kept saying, we need a price tag for this thing um, so that we can be sure that we're making investments in the right decision. And But quantifying, coming back to quantification, is really important. Quantifying all these co-benefits is difficult. I think these Nexus projects will, for the time being, be more expensive. So um, we really need other reasons to try and help local governments to take decisions that can be more resilient in the end, um, somehow. So <laughs> more kind of help with the, the stakeholder process itself uh, might be useful. Yeah. Um, we're nearly at the end of our session. Um, Perhaps I'd like to just open up the floor here to the five presenters, whether they want to add any last sort of like last minute uh, comments or uh, observations, please. Yeah, go ahead, Fed. Yes, um, first of all, thank you to all of those that attended and your questions. My observation would be to really think uh, uh, about looking really in a lot of detail into policy coherence between the sectors. We found that in the Pacific Islands, there's a lot of incoherence in terms of who is responsible for cons water conservation or for agricultural productivity or for food security. It, there's a lot of policy fragmentation. So taking a nexus approach, if it's going to be technical with communities, it does need to understand these potential policy gaps and windows that exists. So for example, in the Pacific, we found it's actually the agriculture policies that talk about water management and conservation, not the water policies, because the water policies talk about wash rather than uh, water as a resource or, an, or as an ecosystem service. So really looking at that policy coherence and policy conflict is really important for any future projects. Thanks. Good point. Anyone else? Yes, Kat Dr. Katiaini. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yes. So along with looking at the interlinkages between water, energy and food, I think it's very important to look at the impact of climate change because it's becoming a reality and many of the countries are uh, uh, becoming vulnerable to it. So that is one innovation we need in uh, the Nexus approach, you know, how to bring in the impact of climate change. Thank you. Yeah, just to make it a little bit more complex. Good on you. Um, Daphne, um, we've got three more minutes. So Daphne, yes, go ahead, please. Just a quick final comment. I mean, as I said in my presentation, I think it would be great that- Sorry, sorry, Daphne, can, more... you speak, can you speak up a little bit? I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, sorry. How about this? Yep. So um, it would be great if we could work with more cities to put demonstration projects in place so that people could really see what the benefits are of implementing um, alternative infrastructure systems at urban scales because seeing is believing and um, I think a lot of policy change would follow from that. Absolutely. 
maybe we need some some pilot uh, schemes somewhere to to show some some quick wins, some quick triple wins, or more than triple. Um. So to to close out. I mentioned in my opening statements that this was a wicked problem. Um, and this is kind of a technical term, um, a wicked problem. You know, um, we, we're de dealing with something which is technical, but also social, environmental, very political, um, with economic implications, and so many stakeholders, and all the stakeholders have their own vested interest. And to be honest, I'm not sure um, there is always a solution. Um, and maybe there are many solutions, um, and ma maybe there are there are many bad solutions and some good solutions. Um, but but each case is quite unique, and I think um, today's presentations and particularly the discussion uh, we've had afterwards has really highlighted how difficult this problem is, um, and it's it's um, kind of intractable. But it doesn't mean that uh, that we can't sort of uh, try. And, and get some successes. So I'd like to bring this session to a close. I'd like to thank all the, the presenters and all the participants for their time and their interest in this session on, on water energy food nexus. Um, and I hope maybe some of these ideas that we discussed today can lead um, to moving us forward in this, in this field. So thank you very much. Take care. Good night. <laughs>